Audit. As you know, the globe is urgently trying to make sense of our global economy and its arcane trends. As financial temples teeter, the priesthood is scrambling to maintain our confidence in markets and banking. After derivatives, quantitative easing, trade imbalances, recession, low GDP, nations close to collapsing, and subprime loans, foreclosed homes, and people's taxes spent to bail out too big to fail. Triple A banks again. Fear levels rising as a US crash seems imminent, having smashed the debt ceiling of 14 trillion. Despite protests and clashes in Athens streets, the IMF imposed structurally unjust programs in Greece, where in fact the term economy entered our language from the Greek oikonomia, meaning household management. Well, how are we managing? Theories abound, but in practice, does anyone actually know what the hell's even happening? To regain some sanity, we take a stop call and cross to Texas with our first guest, Ron Paul. Welcome to Rap News, Dr. Paul. The economy, what's your diagnosis of it all? Well, Robert, we dropped the ball. I'm a physician, politician, this is pathological. See, the global economy is chronically ailing. Believe me, the course we've planned it is terminally failing. We're headed towards credit cardiac arrest with deep depression and trauma across the West. Is there a cure? Sure, more capitalism, not less, and the market will take care of the rest. But first, we need a Heimlich maneuver. See, banker gods proclaimed fiat pecunia. And our economy was inflated, totally mangled. We got fiat currencies and lost the gold standard. Huh? Paper money is a worthless commodity. It's the biggest fraud in the history of humanity. All this must cast doubt on the capitalist system. Is it just another pretty theory like communism oh no you see this ain't capitalism the gospel of free marketism adam smith's religion has been perverted by fiscal heathens and what we now have is the cabal of corporatism when state and business lucratively merge yes exemplified by the system of the central reserve but we don't need to borrow more to pay their debt because i'm campaigning to end the fed uh, thank you ron now for another fine Well, I guess you're introducing us. Oh, he likes television. Hey, Michael. Hi, Michael. <laughs> <laughs> that feels good, though. What? We um, can do that. Live Hi, long Columbia. and prosper. Hi, Columbia. Wow. I, when in prison, people do this, too. Oh, and you have a story from prison. I have a prison story, yeah. Okay, before, good... before you start your prison yeah, story, you. let's just tell everybody who and what we are. We are the God Talk guys, uh, Michael Coran, Michael Mack, and uh, we get together each week here at Cambridge Community Access Television to talk about God and talk about matters of faith and to tell stories. And Michael's got a story this week for, from, his, from his past. This is a true story told live and told true as... Um, promised by the storyteller <laughs> so this as affirmed by the storyteller this happened in the 1980s okay uh, yes I was about to get married and or actually courting a woman mm -hmm. she was and somebody who shall remain unnamed oh I love her so much love I have a poem that is that has a title, once, once We Plant the Seed, Love Grows Like a Weed. It's true. Mm -hmm. Even our friendship, whether and we like, what, it, like it or not. And, um, mm -hmm. and how, does, how does this metaphor relate to that relationship? I, I love, I, because I'm more of a, I have more heart now, or have discovered, of all things, I have a heart in my body. Who would mm -hmm. have guessed? Mm. They You're like the, the Tin Man. Yes, I needed to have a body. I, they tell you to get in touch with your heart, but uh, they didn't tell me I need to also be in touch with the body that is around the heart. Mm -hmm. It only took about 25 years, but you cannot rush these things. I had one, one of my dream interpreters. I called him for four years. He would help me with my dreams every week. And he said, Michael, you would get along much better if you take one hand to your heart. You probably might agree. The other hand to your mouth with masking tape and relate to the world like this. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. You, yeah, you can ask for that whenever you I should. I should offer that to well, all What should friends. I call that? What should I call that gesture? You should, you should just walk around with masking tape and do it. <laughs> Say, Michael, um, I, this, I think this will help our conversation. Okay, so it's back in the 80s, and you're courting a woman, yeah. uh, a woman who is, and, and your love is growing like a weed, and what else is happening? So um, I have teach my first class 
in maximum security prison. Oh, and where is that? Is that Walpole? It's is Walpole. It Walpole. It was called Walpole then. Uh huh. What's it called now? Now it's called Cedar Rapids. Oh. Because the the city of Walpole did didn't not want to be associated. Didn't, didn't want their most <laughs> most <laughs> their most famous institution <laughs> to be maximum security prison. Yeah. It was renowned in a certain way. But I went there somewhat innocently. Sort of like Bridgewater. Bridgewater is known for the same thing. Uh, right? State Hospital. Yep. yep. Yeah. So this is what um, I'm remembering and reliving, I hope, what happened uh, my first day teaching at Maximum Security Prison. Mm -hmm. And Michael, who is a, a superb storyteller, if you haven't heard yet, he, he has wonderful shows, one called Speaking in... Hearing voices speaking in tongues. About his about his mother, who was challenged with what was then called schizophrenia, right? Mm -hmm. And his second show is called Conversations with My Molester, A Journey of Faith. That's right. And people can find out about this at Michael... MichaelMacLive.com. Thank you for the blurb. Yeah, and here he is live. So Michael, I am blessed, is going to interrupt me if he feels it's appropriate and help me tell the story even better, and certainly help me with the ending, because I'm having a challenge with okay. it. Okay, okay. So the first thing we have to do is tell it. So here yep. we are, it's your first day yep. at Walpole Maximum Security Prison. Yeah. And so you get, you I, drive there, I, I guess. I drive there yep. and find this is before GPS, not so easy. Yeah. And as I am walking in. The easy way to get to Walpole is to commit a crime, I guess. <laughs> <Ouch>. <laughs> Yes, we, I didn't tell the audience we will also have wonderful jokes <laughs> while this is happening. Will we finish this? We might only have 20 minutes to go. So, I, I'm walking into Walpole. It's a fall afternoon. And a short man is walking out. And he has a briefcase. And he seems like he's a teacher, too. And as you're walking in, are, are gates and... No, this is just, this is just a glass door. Okay. And uh, I ask him, are, are you a teacher? And he says, yes, my name is Dante, he says. Dante. Yes. Like the poet. Like the poet. And I say, oh, I'm teaching here for the first time. Is there anything I should know? And he says, what I've discovered teaching here is that not only the prisoners, but most of us in our lives have written on our bodies um, these words. Um, and, and the words are, I am in this prison, but please don't take me out of here. It's the only home I have. And then he left. Hmm. And I have in, I've eventually seen the wisdom of that. Mm -hmm. So what teaching in maximum security prison maybe helped me a little understand that. So say again what it was that, that he said was the, the most... We are, we are all in prison. Yep. But we've written on the bars, please don't take me out of here. It's the only home I have. Wow. Makes me cry just thinking of it. By the, my own prison. So I walk in then to the main room. Did you ever see him again? No. Nope. Okay. So he was some kind of angel figure. <laughs> yes. I, and there's a huge glass wall, much bigger than this glass wall here at this CCT studio, maybe six times as big. And there's no like, welcome to Walpole. Glad you could come, <laughs> no, no greeter. <laughs> and I look, and I, could, I carefully see there's a little slit at the right-hand corner of this glass wall. And behind it, there's police officers walking, all in blue uniforms. And I go to the little slit, and I stand there. And no one seems to notice me, although I think maybe they were practice, maybe it was choreographed, not to, I mean, it's hard not to notice, it's glass. <laughs> but no one seems to notice me, I'm standing there. 
And I, I think, I don't know if this is true, if I show I'm impatient to get into maximum security prison, they, they're not going to let me in. So I just stand there in my, um, in my Holy Spirit way, just being peaceful, Buddhist way, just I'm going to be here now. And finally a guard comes over and he says, who are you? In that tone? In that tone. I say, um, my name is Michael Coran. I'm a teacher. It's K-O-R-A-N. He says, I know how to spell. You think I'm stupid? Did he say that? Yes. This is true. This is a really true story, especially okay. as I remember. Okay. And I'm a good boy. Still standing in my Buddhist beer now, open heartedness, and I say no. Where's your ID? So I reach in and pull out my driver's license and I give it to him and he walks away and he comes up and I know I'm still standing there very patiently not showing the slightest irritation um, maybe foolishly thinking I would feed their game if I mm. showed I was irritated so he eventually comes back holding the ID on his side of the slit and says what's it worth to you to get your ID back this is, as best I remember, this is a true story, and I'm very proud of my answer. I say, your friendship. And he smiles like you are, and he flips it back to me. And I take it. Now, to get into maximum security prison, it cost you. No, no, not like the prisoners, but even the teachers. You have to put a quarter in a locker, like a, like a Greyhound bus locker. Mm because you can't bring in your keys or your driver's license. Now, remember, this is uh, the 80s, yeah. the early 80s? Yeah, mid-80s. Okay. Yeah. Mid so I lock it in, and then I go to the first gate. And I, when I go in, there's a, often a woman sitting there, and she stamps your uh, hand with a stamp so that you, they can let you out. Mm -hmm. And sometimes when I got to know her, and hi there, Dorothy, how you been? We, she would forget to stamp me. Hmm. And so it was a little trickier getting out. But this day, this is the first day she stamps me. There are seven gates. Sounds like a religious hmm. uh, seven gate. There really are. There are seven gates to get into maximum security prison. One of the gates is a door, or a steel door, I think, automatically closes behind you. And it's a little room about you know, a third of this room, and there's a locked door in front of you with no handles. And I look up, and it must have been, I'm not a good judge of heights, but maybe 50 feet up, there's like a skylight, and I think they're checking me out again to see if I'm worthy of getting into maximum security prison. Hmm. And after a minute or two, again, I'm showing no impatience. The doors open, and I go through. And I eventually get to the school, which is also a locked door. But the guard lets me in, he checks me out, calls and finds out, yes, Michael Coran is a teacher for Boston University. I go in and I meet the secretary. There's four rooms in this little schoolhouse. And the rooms are nice. They're nicer than most, you know, they're old wood. It's really very nice, except for the bar. These are school rooms? Yes. Okay. And the secretary is sitting there, and she says to me, oh, thank you for coming. Your room is across the way, and, and please scream if you, have, if you need any help. I usually hear it when teachers scream. And the word usually, I'm a poet, so the, and the word usually definitely, I think it would even if I wasn't a poet, definitely stands out. But I'm in my, in my kind of being good and oblivious mode, I kind of get I don't feel my fear because, I mean, if I had felt my fear, I wouldn't have probably taken the job at all, or maybe any job. So I'm not really in touch with how scary this is, but I, some part of me might know a little. So I go into the classroom, and there are about 17 men, all in jeans, and I sit down, like here, and 
it's not like other classrooms I've taught at UMass Lowell where I, they, they, they ask me questions. I don't get a chance to even introduce myself. Why are you here, teach? One of them says. I'm still trying to be calm. And, but when I get scared, even if I don't know I'm scared, I tend to go literary, you might have noticed this. And so I say, which is true for me, I say, one of my favorite authors is Dostoevsky. He's written a great crime murder mystery called Crime and Punishment about someone who thought if he was really a brave person, he'd be able to commit a crime and not be bothered by it, like the great leaders in history, like Napoleon. And Dostoevsky said, if you want to find out what society really is like, what the government's like and people are like, because he was in jail for eight years hmm. for being a, a, just a liberal. Go to the prisons. And so I came here to find out what our society is like and what people are really made of. I was myself impressed with this answer. Hmm, that's an impressive answer. Yes, however, the men Said, Were the men impressed with your the answer? The men said, we don't give a... One kind of squeaky guy said, we don't give a fuck what Dostoevsky said. We asked you why you're here, Teach. <laughs> <clears throat> so I forget there's one strike against me. <laughs> <clears throat> and then... I, and I am getting scared, even me. And then when I get scared, I get... This is the God to class. I get religious. I just, I help me, Lord. And I think of Jesus. And Jesus said, Jeshua, I like to call him now, Jeshua said, he asked his students, did you visit me when I was in prison? And his students who seem like many of my students and me, somewhat clueless, said, we never saw you in prison. And Jeshua said, anytime anyone is in prison, that's me. And I, I thought this was, and the same, and then another guy, different, big, rough, beauty guy. You don't seem to get it, Teach. We don't give a fuck about this gift you and Jesus. Why the fuck are you here? So I figured two strikes again. This is my last chance. I take, I take my Buddhist breath. <sighs> When I was in high school, in a scared, as you can see, nerdy intellectual guy, I had my glasses on then, all the girls, or many of them in high school, loved guys like you. Tattoos, jeans, big biceps, tough. And I really think this is true that if I come to teach here, you will teach me what I didn't have then. And they think for a moment, I even thought there might have been a tear in someone's eyes. And they said, and the leader, a big tall guy, steel like said, you can stay teach. Now, my first class, this was sociology of religion. And we were going to discuss. Same group of guys? Same group of guys. We were going to discuss. This is the last part of the story I'll tell you today. Mm -hmm. We were going. Oh, is there going to be more to the story another maybe, time? Maybe, maybe. Okay. The last, but the first class is sociology of religion. One student brings, he's dressed in black. I don't know how he got the black, but he's dressed in black, black jeans. He brings in a Bible, and he says, the Bible's the word of God. This is a sociology of religion. We're going to compare different religions. If you don't believe what the Bible says, you're going to go to hell. You're all going to go to hell, in looking at me too, and you deserve to go to hell. And another guy gets up, this short guy that had been cursing me out, and says, 
The Bible's a bunch of shit. <laughs> you need to believe in the big daddy in the sky. Oh, you poor pathetic little baby boy. Then a third person gets up and said, this class is a circus, it's a circus. And the fourth one gets up and says, that's because you're the clown. And I take my finger and I say to the, the person who's saying you're a clown, I said, you please sit down. And he says, don't you point your finger at me, teach. And I say, boy, it sounds like the word of God to me. And I pull my finger back and take two breaths again. That was our first class. Now, Michael is a great storyteller. He's now going to tell me maybe what he feels, thinks, or ways to tell the story even better. I'm not sure of the ending. You can tell me. It's something like that did happen. Hmm? Oh, now I'm hearing it. Mm. Has the story got more elaborate? <laughs> And uh, well, it's memory now. It's it's, yeah. it's so long ago. But it this really, and, and it's hard, you know, when you tell a story many times, you think it really. You start to think that the really things happened. that you're saying really happen. Yeah, but as, as best as I remember, this is <clears throat> Philip Roth told his father. His father was a tailor from Europe, and his father said, "Philip, what do you do for? I don't understand. What are you doing for a living?" And Philip Roth said, "I'm writing. I write fiction, and they pay me, Dad." He says, you lie to people? And he says, no, Dad, fiction is truer than truth. Hmm. So this was this really happened. I mean, it, it, it you know, might have been condensed, and, but it, this really, really happened as best as I can remember. But, but I, 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 I do change things when I tell them. I mean, the finger pointing happened. Um, I'm not sure I had the wherewithal to tell him Oh, I take your words to be the voice of God. I think I'm adding that now. Hmm. But, I, but I think in some way it was true. I took his word as the voice of God and pulled my finger back. Because it was the word, voice of God. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, um, how long did you teach there? I only, I punked, I only taught one semester there, and then I moved to medium security. Okay. I was, too, I was, I was very scared. Oh, you're out of the picture, man. You got to get oh, back in the picture. Thank you. I was, yes, I was so scared I was out of the picture. Did, um, over the course of the semester, did um, you develop, did things warm up? My students actually accused me. Accused you? Yep, yeah, correctly. They said, are you trying to make this class more boring? <laughs> right? I said, we will now for this class, after that class, where people were, were, you know, standing up. And I said, for our next class, we will read aloud from the textbooks of sociology of religion and discuss what we feel and think they're saying. <laughs> Honest, that's true, too. Mm -hmm. And one student did come up to me, see, I, what do I know, and said to me, he was the shortest guy there, and he said to me, I would, I would have jumped in to help you. You have no idea how close you were to getting hurt. Hmm. These were students who had taken teachers hostage. Um. Did you get into any of their personal stories, or? Oh, I, uh, some of them are friends. One of them is a friend of mine. I mean, you were doing this thing called pros and cons. Was that at the medium security? No, that was the, I, the, 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 my, my, I, I, I made a play of this. You can see it on, on YouTube, pros and cons, hmm. liberating stories from prison, pros, hmm. P-R-O-S-E. And no, that was about this, this, this um, teaching in maximum security prison, but then I, took a lot of liberties with, yeah. with uh, putting in st stories I heard from other places. Hmm. Hmm. So how many, um, over the course of that semester, was it like eight classes that you had? I think it was close to 14. I okay. Think. I think uh, a usual semester is 14 or 15. And so did you settle into some kind of rhythm? I mean, so that you, you would arrive on the week. Yep. 
and um, you got to know faces, and they oh, got they, to know they, you. I, I, I mean, I, I, I might bring some more stories in there. But so, uh, some of the people became friends for life. I haven't seen one of them. Um, I, I, I mean, I really, it was really true what I said. I, these guys had what I didn't have. My relationship with Michelle now is better when I'm t telling the story and remembering what it's like to be... Because of all the tattoos on yes, your body? Yes, no, I, 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 we're getting along better now that I'm getting in touch with my tattoo nature. Hmm. My, my prison nature. I mean, we, I know, it, I, know my, I have my own prison, but I didn't put tattoos on my arms when I was in there. But now that I'm retelling the story, I'm getting that energy back. Hmm. And the girls loved those guys. They did. Hmm. They really did. Because the girls are brought up, this is my myth and theory, girls are brought up, especially when I was growing up, to be Miss Goody Two Shoes. And so if they could be with someone who could, you know, break the rules, wow! Hmm. <laughs> oh, I'm free! Get me out of Miss Goody Two Shoes! I heard a story, I think it was on This American Life, about a guy who, uh, um, had a girlfriend who went to prison for something or other, and uh, they made a deal since she was going to be in for like three years that if he wanted to see somebody else um, on the side, that, that he could. Um, because he's a man and he has needs. Um, and so they. You got. I, I understand. Seconds, yeah. And so they made that arrangement, and he said it was the biggest, um, it was the best pick up line of his life, basically, to say that his girlfriend was in prison. That it really um, well made him attractive to other women. Anyway, we've got five seconds left. Thank you for joining us. Freedom from all of our prisons.